Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Mark Rogers TV's College Football Coast to Coast. We come your way each and every Monday right here on Blab at 1 o'clock Eastern Time. It's uh, 10 a.m. on the West Coast, and we're talking college football. This is an extension of what I do on YouTube and at MarkRogersTV.com, being revamped right now as we talk college football all the time, 24-7, 365. So bring your questions, bring your comments, and we love to talk it up. Check me out at YouTube. Again, Mark Rogers TV, 1,600 college football videos. Uh, most recently reviewed uh, the Stanford-Washington State game, a close one for the Cardinal at the Wire, Florida, uh, drubbing Georgia and moving on to most likely the SEC Eastern Division Championship. Just have to take care of a few details, meaning Vanderbilt and South Carolina and talking college football playoff. And that's what we're going to start with right now. So again, follow me on Twitter at Mark Rogers TV and join us here on Blab each and every Monday at one o'clock Eastern time to talk some college football. You can just listen in, ask your questions off to the side, or you can take a seat and we'll talk some college football uh, directly. Of course, this is the day. The day that college football fans have been waiting for since week one, when there has been debate across the land about who are the best four teams in college football. I am not going to tell you definitively who the four best teams in college football are. That's why we're playing the last five weeks of the season. I will also tell you that based on this system, we are not going to know, as we didn't know last year at the end of all the games, all the conference championship games, who were the four best teams in college football. We knew who had the six best resumes, and then there had to be a choice between Ohio State, Baylor, and TCU. Uh, the Buckeyes run to a national championship. In many eyes, justify that selection. Not in mine. I'm not saying that Ohio State didn't deserve or earned their way into a playoff spot. I'm just saying merely that TCU and Baylor did as well. The College Football Playoff Committee has a near impossible task in selecting four teams. College football fans, especially those rooting for teams in good position, they don't need to worry because they line up games and have games scheduled that can play their team into a college football playoff spot. So... Baylor fans, don't worry about where your team's ranked right now, even though you have yet to play anyone. Same, of course, in the Big Ten with Ohio State and Michigan State in particular. Iowa fans, if you come out uh, 7th, 8th, 10th this week in the, the initial college football playoff rankings, don't be alarmed. You have uh, some difficult games, and most notably, you're probably going to face an undefeated Michigan State or Ohio State team in the Big Ten Championship game, and that's going to be your ticket as an undefeated team in the college football playoffs. So let's go around the country. I invite anybody who is joined to jump in here and talk some college football. Uh, we've got the college football playoff selections tonight. We have the issue of the Duke-Miami play. We have Frank Beamer announcing his retirement at um, Virginia Tech. And a number of games as we get to Nazim and Betty. I hope I pronounced that right in just a second. Uh, Duke, North Carolina this week. Notre Dame, Pitt, Arkansas, Ole Miss, Florida State, Clemson. A huge one that will decide most likely the ACC. TCU, Oklahoma State as we see if the Cowboys are for real. Utah, Washington, Minnesota, Ohio State. And the huge, huge one in the SEC, LSU and Alabama. So let's bring in. A caller right now, unlock a seat, and we'll get this thing started. So as they continue to try to get in here, hopefully their internet uh, is knocking things out. Let's let's talk about something that hit me that I don't think you're going to hear discussed anywhere across the nation, and it pertains to selecting the college football playoff. And as I... Uh, hesitate at times here. I'm looking to the side to see some questions to see if I can uh, answer any questions or respond to any comments that you have concerning uh, the college football playoff committee or anything else. The conference races, I think they're too de-emphasized now because of the college football playoff that if you have a team out there that's lost two games, unless you're Ole Miss because you play in the SEC, if you have a team that's lost two games and you're a fan of that team, 
you're hearing all this college football playoff and we've de-emphasized the conference races. And I think that's very, very unfortunate. But people want to win the gold medal. They want to win the championship, the championship. And again, that's de-emphasized the college uh, conference races. So I'm sitting there watching Stanford and Washington State. And I will get to the Duke of Miami situation in just a second. Uh, watching late night. So I'm a bit bleary eyed at close to 2 a.m. and going to uh, turn around quickly and knock out some analysis on uh, Washington State and Stanford and some other games. And uh, Stanford, of course, hung on by the skin of their teeth against a game Washington State team that's very much improved uh, on defense. So Cougars get the ball. They're down by two points, 30 to 28. They march the football down the field with Luke Falk at quarterback. They convert a couple fourth downs. They put themselves in position based on a beautiful pitch and catch from Falk to Don Williams down the seam. And then execute perfectly an out pass with two seconds left to get themselves in even better position. They line up their field goal kicker, who's gone five for five in this game, and he hooks the miss off to the being a left-footed kicker, hooks it off to the right, and um, Stanford wins the ball game. So if you've ever listened to me uh, on my platform, Mark Rogers TV, or anywhere else I'm out there, uh, you know that I'm all about results, and I would love to come up with a college football playoff system, which I have. I would love to see it implemented that deals strictly with the results of the games uh, and then the the uh, strength of the schedule second. Then um, glad to see that uh, Jamie Hancock at Preps Nation joining us, everybody else joining us, so please ask your questions. I will continue to monitor on the side and answer them as I'm dealing with uh, Washington State and Stanford late Saturday night. So Stanford, one loss in the Pac-12, seemingly the the last bastion of hope for the Pac-12 in making the college football playoff. One loss, they've been extremely impressive since opening day in losing to Northwestern. Well, Washington State misses a field goal that would have defeated Stanford. And Washington State, an improving team, Really has taken off this year, but not a great team, not a top 25 team, probably one of the 45 or 50 best teams in the country. And Stanford would have lost to that team. OK, they didn't. Washington State missed the field goal. Well, as I understand it, the college football playoff committee, they're looking at the metric of wins and losses as they should. Number one. So uh, two and three lost teams aren't going to be considered at this point, and they should not. But this is where it gets tricky, and this is where the system contradicts itself. So the the second uh, category that the College Football Playoff Committee looks at is advanced statistics and metrics, really locking down these teams and looking how they have performed uh, in an objective way in regards to, again, the results statistically. They, they pour through those metrics. And I think this is not a criticism of the College Football Playoff Committee because they do an outstanding job. I really believe that they're in it for the right reasons and that they are doing their best to select the four best teams. I just don't think it's possible uh, to justify. So my point is, is that Stanford's uh, performance on the field was not affected by that kick, meaning that Stanford won the game because a kid from the other team missed a kick. Had he made the kick, the third criteria in this is that they are simply going by the eye test and evaluating football teams based on the eye test. Well, the eye test would not have proven any different had the Washington State kicker made or missed the field goal because Stanford's performance is exactly the same. So had the Washington State kicker made the kick, Stanford loses the game, Stanford's performance is null and void. It's exactly the same as it was winning the game if you follow me there, and we can discuss that a little bit further. All right. Uh, did we see any comments off to the side? We'll continue to march through the games right here. Uh, somebody's asking me here, uh, Coach, I uh, don't want to screw up your name. Uh, your comments regarding the decision to suspend the refs in that Miami-Duke game. So to me, and I may have poor eyesight, 
I didn't think that the knee touching down was conclusive. And I know that was only one of three issues in the review of that play at the end of the Miami Duke game, which in my time of watching college football is probably the combination of the craziest play and the most impactful game, depending on what Duke does the rest of the season that I've ever seen. So again, the focus of most of the criticism comes to the, the, the portion of the play where the Miami player appeared to be down before he pitched the ball back. That was inconclusive to me. Um, again, maybe I haven't seen enough angles. I've seen the play probably five or six times, which puts me probably in the lower third of the country in terms of reviewing this play. Uh, I did not see it live. I didn't see it in its immediacy. I was watching other games and then suddenly on Twitter was alerted to the fact that Miami had somehow won this game. And it was funny because I actually thought that Duke scoring the touchdown at the goal line was controversial and they probably reviewed that. And that's what gave Miami the win, but was unaware of the play. So that was the first issue. And, and that's the, the portion of the play that most people are concentrating on is that the Miami players knee was apparently down. I thought that was inconclusive. Had they ruled that the other way, that his knee was down, I would have said, fine. I, th I thought there was too much traffic in the way. Um, and, and for as good as the technology is, and with the cray, uh, what do we got here? We've got uh, coach coming in with uh, totally crazy. That and the Doug Flutie Hail Mary pass. Yeah, it was totally crazy. I do have an opinion about the Doug Flutie play. Okay. Uh, yeah, so Jamie Hancock from Preps Nation. Uh, joining us uh, to say about the uh, the worst part of the play was the block in the in the back in the middle of the field. Yeah, there's no question about that. So so that was a blatant penalty uh, that would have set up Miami at their own eight yard line uh, with one play left to try to pull off practically the impossible, which I guess they just did to a certain extent, and pull off a 92 yard touchdown on one play. That's what would have had to happen. Yeah, if you if you see the the play, you see a few different issues. Number one is the knee was down, apparently. Number two was the block in the back, as Preps Nation points out to us, that would have set up Miami with one last play at their own eight-yard line. Um, do we know definitively if the refs can call after the fact a penalty like that, that they're, they're reviewing the, the video based on boundaries, based on ball possession, those types of things are under review, not necessarily blocking penalties, or they could they could find a holding penalty on any review and call it. Um, yeah, Preps Nation also referring to the third part of this. What we were going to get to is the players ran onto the field as they were about to score. Look at the official's eyes. He saw him and reached for his flag. Yeah, the, the players went crazy. They were out of control. They They jumped on the field. One particular player was out ahead of everyone. I think it was one of their wide receivers. Uh, Rashawn Scott, uh, he got out onto the field, and that would be a penalty as well. Uh, I believe that would have been enforced uh, in most situations had there been time on the clock after because it's a celebration. Well, he was on the field during the play. So that so that's a, uh, a penalty that would, would have nullified the touchdown. I was thinking celebration there for a second. Uh, technically illegal. Yes, it is. So... Um, yeah, it's it's very unfortunate, especially re regardless of the team's records. But we're looking at a Duke team that was undefeated in the ACC, and with with a muddled ACC with Pitt and North Carolina each with one loss, and Duke and North Car Carolina playing this week could easily have a situation where Duke beats North Carolina head to head, so they take control of the division again, but then they lose a game later where a tie would send Duke to the ACC championship game. Now they've got to win it outright, um, depending on the scenario with the other two teams, North Carolina and Duke. So David Cutcliffe, a first-class act, who I used to interview on, on a weekly basis back in the um, mid to late 90s when he was at Ole Miss and, and took over the head coaching post for Tommy Tuberville. Class act, nice guy, has done remarkable uh, things with the Miami program and building them up from basically nothing. They they had fallen from where Spurrier built the program, and uh, he's taken them to three consecutive bowl appearances. And um, 
unfortunately, I, and I think he handled it well. He was outraged, but he he kept his composure, stated his case, said, this is it. This is the issue. You should be able to go back when a call is blatantly missed that decides a game. So I agree with his point here that if if we were going to run back and try to review a play that would change the course of a game and it was anything but the final play in which time expired, you can't do that because you can't determine what's going to happen after that. But on the final play of the game, you can determine the outcome of the game based on the video replay. All right, uh, we've got uh, Mark. How do you envision a fair college football standings and playoff system? All right. So we just watched Temple on Saturday night play a really good football game against Notre Dame and some breaks went against the Owls or who knows, they could have upset Notre Dame. It was that close. So the group of five is going to get left out of this situation. Temple's lost. Houston and um, Memphis are undefeated. And think about this. The Ole Miss Rebels control the West right now. They could march on to an SEC championship having lost to Memphis. By two touchdowns. That game was not a fluke. The Tigers outplayed them across the board, fell behind by two touchdowns, and completely destroyed the Rebels after that. Memphis is a really good football team. The three of those teams, Houston, Temple, and Memphis, they have defeated the likes of Penn State, getting better, could have beaten Notre Dame very close down to the wire. And again, if we're evaluating performance and not necessarily results, played Notre Dame neck and neck. Beat Ole Miss. Now they're going to play each other. So that's going to help the college football playoff committee. Most likely it's going to get a bit messy there in the American Athletic Conference, and they're not going to have to make a difficult decision. Here's the difficult decision. Memphis runs the table. Ole Miss runs the table. Memphis finishes the season undefeated, having defeated Ole Miss head-to-head. And Ole Miss is the winner of the SEC I still believe is the best conference in college football. I think the metrics would bear that out, but I think it's close. I don't think it's a dominant lead as the best in college football. Ole Miss is going to be a two-loss SEC winner against Memphis, a zero-loss American Athletic Conference winner who beat Ole Miss head-to-head by 13 points. That's a mess for the college football playoff. So uh, any other questions or comments, uh, we, we can sort through those. But uh, I think, okay, back to the fair college football uh, playoff situation is you have to represent all the conferences. That has to be the starting block. So it's automatically flawed when you have five major conferences trying to fit into four spots. That's the big issue with this. So think of it this way. Even if it's a three-loss team in the Pac-12, Most likely, there has been no play outside of that Pac-12 that has determined that that team's not good enough to participate with the other teams. They play in silos. Look at the Big 12 this year. The Big 12 going into this season, based on perception mostly, but also based on the reality of their poor play and postseason play and also regular season out-of-conference games last year, was generally considered to be the worst conference, the Big 12. Okay, right now they're playing exciting football, so I'm hearing comments made all over the place that the Big 12, and we'll get to Tom in just a second, that the Big 12 is one of the better conferences. And this is based on what? This is based on an eyeball test because they're playing 66 to 60 games. (laughs) This is what the Big 12 has done outside the Big 12 this year. TCU beat Minnesota. TCU, who we consider one of the best teams in the country, went to Minnesota, beat an average Big Ten team, average at best, by six points. Oklahoma, possibly vying for the Big 12 championship, went to Tennessee, a four-loss team, and got outplayed drastically by three and a half quarters, pulled out that game. Those are the two marquee wins for the Big 12. And Tom, if you can jump back in here, we'll get you on the line. That's all we know about the Big 12. These teams don't play enough cross-sectional games for us to evaluate them against each other. They play in silos. They play maybe one game, maybe one game. And if you look at Ole Miss, they didn't play anybody outside the SEC. So how can we possibly compare them to a team in another conference? All right. It's hard to win on the road, no matter who you are. It is depending on the venue, depending on uh, the situation. SEC is the best conference. Uh, That's Vic Boone. I believe that it is. I I think that, um, 
it was decidedly better for a five to seven year run. I, I think we anointed the SEC as the best conference way too early based on a couple national championships, but I think it proved out based on postseason play, not just in the BCS championship game, but in BCS bowls overall and also all postseason play. Uh, the NFL draft is a great indicator of talent. The recruiting rankings over time, great indicator of talent. Uh, what has been the downgrade in the last few years of the SEC has been the quarterback play. So when that 2012 class of Manziel, McCarron, Murray, Franklin, Mettenberger left, they've generally not been replaced. The best quarterbacks in the SEC right now reside in Mississippi State and in Knoxville, Tennessee with Josh Jobs at Tennessee. So your two best quarterbacks in the league are playing for non-contenders. So that's hurting the SEC right now. We got, uh, yeah, Jamie Hancock from Prep Station on board with me in terms of quarterback play. But the SEC is the best conference in college football for a number of reasons. The wide receiver play in the SEC uh, is exceptional. So if you go back a decade to 15 years, the Big Ten and the Pac-12 produced exceptional wide receivers at Ohio State, Michigan, and in the Pac-12 at a number of schools. The SEC has blown everyone away. Wide receiver play. And going back forever, secondary outside linebackers who can get to a quarterback and defensive ends who can get to a quarterback, the SEC has the upper hand right there. Always been the SEC up and down position, uh, yeah, the quarterback position, top two receivers in the country this year in the Big 12. Vic Boone is telling us uh, that must be Josh Doxson who plays at Oklahoma, uh, Corey Coleman at Baylor. Baylor Bears also have a really good one to compliment him in uh, Katie Cannon. Uh, Sterling Shepard, a really good one at uh, Oklahoma. Yeah, Doxon plays at TCU. Yes, Doxon at TCU, if I misspoke. Josh Doxon, yes, plays at TCU. And, uh, of course, uh, yeah, Coleman and K Katie Cannon are a serious deal there at Baylor. All right, uh, we're probably going to shut this thing down here in just a second. So what we're going to do here, and we're just getting started, so it's a little bit rough. We're going to set up shop here every Monday at 1 o'clock, 1 o'clock Eastern time. So set that to your specific time zone as I roll out of bed from a late night at work. Roll out of bed and start trying to talk to college football right out of the gate. 1 o'clock Eastern time, and... um we talk college football, and we'll do it here on Blab, and this is our first shot at it right now. So appreciate you guys. We'll post this on YouTube at my channel, Mark Rogers TV. 1,600 college football videos. Give me a request on anything you'd like to see because my, because my views aren't what they should be. This is what people tell me after they watch uh, our college football content, that we should be getting more views, and people are extremely nice to jump out there and say, hey, what can I do for you? I've probably had five to eight people just in the last week say, what can we do for you? Uh, 50, 100 views on a video, not good enough. We, we need to get the word out and talk some logical college football. That's all I'm trying to do is um, kind of strip away a lot of the perception and bias and talk college football across the board. Um, all right. Uh, one more comment from uh, Preps Nation here. Uh, you can be imperfect uh, position on left tackle and still get hurt. Okay, we're talking about Laquan Treadwell. I thought he meant a left tackle. Uh, yeah, Treadwell's uh, phenomenal. Between Laquan Treadwell, who I really got to see gun to gun for the first time this year against uh, Auburn on Saturday, but I've seen him play a ton of football in the last three years. And from the time he stepped on the field the first night against Vanderbilt, he, you know, he's, he's, he, he initially struck me as Michael Irvin out there with the long stride and the uh, the reach, the wingspan. That's who he struck me as initially. Uh, he doesn't have elite speed, but it's funny when you watch the NFL combines, how many great receivers don't have elite speed. There's only a few guys out there that have elite speed, and most of them don't even turn out to be really good wide receivers in the NFL. Um, again, uh, Laquan Treadwell, between he and Michael Thomas, from what I'm hearing from the McShays and the Kuypers of the world, will vie for that first draft position by a wide receiver. Uh, so, again, Mark Rogers TV, follow me on Twitter. I'll follow you back. We'll discuss and debate some college football. Would love to see you back here at 1 o'clock Eastern time. 
uh, every Monday right here on Blab. We're testing this thing out. I think it's a beautiful platform. Love it. Love it. Love the interaction. Love that I can review the comments and the questions and go at it. So I appreciate the support and we will check you out next Monday.